So again, we have um, uh, Jehoash, um, and this is again during the the, um, the seventh year of Jehu. Um, Jehoash becomes the uh, king, reigns forty years, both uh, an actual measured forty years, and of course a symbolic one. Forty being what? What do we usually associate the number forty with symbolically? Like a cleansing or fasting. Yes, you know, uh, yes, uh, it is for cleansing. It is for fasting. Uh, it is uh, the the um, uh, number of years that Israel, the children of Israel, were in uh, the wilderness uh, on the exodus out of Egypt to finally entering into the promised land. Uh, in the, in about three forty four more days, we're going to hear about another another number forty. You know, and the number of days that our Lord, following His triumph resurrection resurrection from the grave, uh, dwelt among His disciples. Again, an actual number of days, but also a, a symbolic one. That here is God with His people in the wilderness. Before he goes to the promised land, equipping them for their continuing, uh, do, our, our, their and our continual dwelling on this, in this world, in this wilderness, you know, while we undergo our 40, 40 year um, symbolic pilgrimage. Until we also then go into the promised land of heaven. So yeah, to, to so that it's not only an actual number, but a reminder that it is God Himself who is retaining control. You know, and that that it is an it is an era that God Himself has appointed. So so God's God's era of completion when He completes His His work. For his people here in this in this uh, kingdom of earth, and importantly, his mother's name, mentioning of who the mother is. Typically, in the genealogies, we don't see the name of the mom, you know, because. Because inheritance is by virtue of your connection with your father. You know, you inherit your property in Old Testament times from your father. And that's typically why that wasn't referenced in the genealogy. It's, it's not just talking about, you know, it's, it's not denying the work of, of the mom. After all, scriptures are clear that all of us are born into this life through a mother. But the mention here is, is, a, is a signifier and, and as a reminder that indeed women have an important role in the kingdom of God and not just as in birthing and taking care of babies when they're little. Because it mentions it here in terms of, in the context of, he has become king. You know, Joe has just become king. And then by mentioning of his mother, she's the queen mother. She's royalty. And particularly in the kingdom of God, so is every faithful Christian mother. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a calling, it's a vocation, it's a role of service, you know, and, and, and it's an honor. So just like we hear in the Passion narrative, when Jesus praises Mary Magdalene uh, you know, for anointing his body for burial when she uh, uses that jar of, of of very expensive perfume, you know, anoints his feet with it and then uh, wipes it with her with her hair. 
you know, as she's weeping in, in sorrow and contrition. And then Jesus uh, says that wherever this gospel is, is preached in the world, that it will be also preaching her act of loving service for Jesus as a memorial to her. So it's a, it's a memorializing here of of the very importance of of of, of the role of mother. You know, for for kings, for queens, but for but for all of the princes and princesses of the kingdom of God. We're all part of a royal court. You know, so that the the charge that's often le leveled, and this is especially by the world, not by by Christians, you know that the Bible is so patriarchal and and doesn't acknowledge uh, women. Here's one very clear instance where it does. You know, and and again, while it's mentioned as historical facts, you know, this is this is Johash's mother. This is her name. She's from Beersheba. But mentioning it in this context when it otherwise doesn't have to be, you know, is is drawing our attention to see what what is actually signifying here beyond its historical uh, fact presentation. In, in particularly because what we're about to see here is how faithful this king is. It's also it's also a testimony to his upbringing. You know, under the tutelage of his father and mother. You know, this, this is from where he, he learns it, you know, there and, uh, and also in the house of the Lord. But particularly, again, the, the very high and noble calling of, of parents to be examples to their children of Christian living, of, of moral living, of righteously civil living in, in, in society. You know, and, and then as we're going to see here, and as, as it's detailed, that here's the things that he does, you know, in, in order and to demonstrate his, his uh, faithfulness to his calling to be a king over God's people. And, and especially first things first. Let's take care of the house of the Lord. Let's get things right, you know, there in, uh, right there anew. And he does what is right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. Except for one very crucial error. And, and that's uh, as we see in verse 3. Still the high places, you know, and, and, and where it's known, you know, so that it's, it's here, at least during this era, the priests aren't participating in it. You know, they're not encouraging it, you know, by their own participation and going, yeah, hey, this is cool. You know, look, look at how wonderful it is to be worshiping God out in nature in this in this outdoors, um, you know, in this on this outdoor altar, you know, and and those words aren't intended to to condemn, you know, the the occasional, you know, because we've done that for a number of years in Tony with our service by the lake, you know, so that it's 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 not the doing of that that's that's the that's the issue. But again, what, what's the intent and what's the purpose? And, and the high place's purpose is to worship other false gods and to call upon their name and, and to seek a mountaintop experience with a God other than you know, the one true God, the God who has adopted you know, Israel as, as his own precious children. So again, that this is a crucial mistake, not, you know, and even though it doesn't directly impact, again, by full participation of the priests, you know, it's it still is 
is misleading to the people. Wow, they didn't tear down these these pagan altars. I wonder what that means. Is this is this giving tacit approval? You know, it's it's a fair question. And again, by its inclusion here, yeah, you know, it's 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 making that same point. They did really well, but one thing they lacked. You know, they they lacked the courage, um, the fortitude, the will to do this as um, even though they weren't being used again by the by the priests of of God, nevertheless, that would have been a it would have been a very powerful testimony to say, not here. Not, not in this kingdom, for this is the kingdom of the one and only God. Because as we see, the people still went and, and sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Not necessarily, you know, not to the one true God. But in, I, I, I put it in these terms, hedging their bets. Oh, we worship this God, but but just in case that's not right, let's let's hedge this bet. You know, let's appease these other gods too. You know, and let's let's implore their help and power. You know, can't hurt. Sure can. Because any belief and any action connected to belief that isn't directed to the one true God is destructive of faith. Because faith lives by the word of God. Taking a little, uh, little, okay, it's, it's a tangent. I was going to say sidestep. It's a tangent. Faith, at its essence, is a living creature. You know, this isn't a head thing. It's very much a heart thing. But it's a divine thing because God creates faith. You know, th those words aren't, you know, you, you know those words. You've heard those before. But sometimes we forget that when it says that when, when God creates something, it's alive. You know, not just organically alive, but spiritually alive. You know, and, and for and for God's people, we, we live by that living faith. Faith is a creature. God speaks, believe. And this creature named faith springs forward and works this faith in us and causes us to believe this word of God. But it continues to live by that word of God. It needs that word of God. And when it's not giving that word of God, which is its only food. And, and Jesus echoes that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Because that word feeds faith, the bread of life. And if it's not getting that word, it's starving to death. And it certainly is not getting that word, you know, when when that person is professing a word that is not God's. Faith hears that and, and doesn't and doesn't receive it. I don't know what you're talking about, faith says. I don't know who that God is. It's not my God. And again, after a long starvation. From the word. Faith dies. You know, and that's why this is such a um, such a travesty. That even while it's not being explicitly promoted. It's, it's also not being uh, directly uh, prohibited uh, for the people. Because, you know, they, they know what the people are doing. Small community. It's a small world. And even as the word says, it's very clear what they're doing. And for the sake of the souls of those people, 
it, it should have been it should have been ended, including by as the prayer, lead us not into temptation. You know, it means to remove those those barriers to righteousness. You know, and, and to remove those things that do tempt us. You know, so that we don't succumb to the way of temptation. You know, as as um, we we now now going back to that term hedging, but not about hedging a bet, but providing a safety hedge. As as in our mother Eve. Yeah, you know, when the devil comes and says, did God really say you can't eat all this, you know, from all these beautiful and delicious looking trees? And then she says, but of course, you know, we can, except for one. You know, and, and we, we neither eat of it, nor do we touch it. The, the prohibition against touching is a hedge. The sin is in the is is in the eating and the partaking because again it's about taking in a word other than what God Himself speaks. Now don't eat this one. It's poison to your soul. It's deadly. But every other one, other one, you no, know, uh, I have made this fruitful for you. You know, eat and be filled. Eat and be satisfied. But the hedging of, no, we're not even going to touch it, lest we be led into temptation. And, of course, the devil used that and twisted it on its head and, and caused Eve and then Adam with her to fall to that temptation and, and partake of that, that deadly fruit and to fall into sin and and we with them. You know, so that the hedging is a good thing. But it also can be a prohibitory thing too. That's not necessarily germane to, to this. But that was that is what how the what how the priest should have reacted here. Yeah, we need to get rid of these. Lest lest the people be drawn to continue those those same um, deadly practices. And and they did. Verse 4 talks about two different kinds of money. In the, in the New King James, it renders it as census money is the first one, and then assessment money. And then we'll add in the third one, the uh, money that a man purposes in his heart to bring. The last one is an offering. A, a free will or a from the heart uh, or a love offering you know that this is you know this is something that everybody was free to give but not but not commanded to give not in the same way as these first, that the other two are commanded this one is you're free to give you know and and there, the encouragement would be you know, give in, give in proportion to how God has given to you. You know, if he's been rich toward you, you can be rich you know, back towards God by, by giving to his house for the needs of his people. And if the Lord has given you little, you know, especially to put it in modern terms, you know, a, a widow living on a fixed income. You know, maybe a, a small uh, pension, um, either from her work or her husband's work and, and, and Social Security and the like. You know, to, you know she, she won't be able to give as much, again, in a, in, a, in a gross amount, but certainly proportionally. But now the other two, one is census. And when you hear the term census, what do you think? Just counting people. Yeah, you're counting people. And so the census money is one that's lev levied for every single person. Hmm. You know, so that everybody has a tax, if you will, 
on on the census apportionment. So it's it's a per capita or per head uh, payment. You know, as opposed to the assessment. And, and, and that's more like an income tax or, or even a property tax that's due from you if you have income or you have own property or the like. So it's, it's an assessment based on, on again, in, in relation to what you own. Yeah, so that it's, it's, it's again so that these three types are per head. Everybody owes it, and then and then the and then the the other assessment is that that's in proportion to again how richly you know God has blessed everyone. That's why there's a census uh, apportionment. But then God has given you know un you know dif differential uh, gifts, and so. That that's returned to him again by the law, and that's why the third category for the offerings, this is for both you know rich and poor alike. So all of these different ways God has has given to His people, and uh, and to and and for the purpose of seeing, firstly how rich God has been towards us. He has given each of us rich blessings, life. You know, we each have a life. And the things that pertain to it equally. And then we can go to the next level and say, and but how much more has God given to me than just my life? You know, and here, daily bread. He gives daily bread to all, but to some he gives more. So that they are blessed with the opportunity to do more. For some, it's because they have a larger household. You know, and there's more hungry mouths to fill. You know, for, for others, there's, you know, there's, you know, fewer, fewer, fewer hungry mouths to fill. And, and thereby, you know, has, have the opportunity to perhaps return more. You know, especially in the, in the, in the free will offering. So that these, these were, this was how this was, um, so that you know, on all these levels, this was seen to be fair. They, everybody pays. Well, that's fair. Those who have more, uh, more is demanded of you. Well, that's fair. And you have the opportunity to, to give even more as God himself moves you through the Holy Spirit. And that's more than fair. The tithes would be especially a good example of the second one. Tithes okay. were required of everyone. But it was always a tenth of what you had, you know, so that in your farming, for example, um, you know, Kyle grows more and, and more varieties of peppers in his garden than anybody else I've ever seen. So that he is blessed with, with a rich harvest of peppers, you know, more so than any of the rest of us. But his requirement, if, if we're still living in Old Testament times, would be 10%. You know, one-tenth. That's the tithe. So he would be giving more you know, overall, but he's giving the same proportion, the same tenth. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the same way here, so that everybody's giving a tenth of what they have first been given by God. You know, that's what God especially wanted them to meditate upon. He said, I'm only asking you to give a little of the much that I have been given you first. And, and teaching us how, how generous God is. And that because we've been made in his image and that we're restored in his image by the power of the gospel, 
we too are greatly blessed to be generous like God. And so that we have a guideline, you know, again, in the Old Testament, they had a very clear guideline, 10%. You know, and that wasn't a stingy amount. You know, that was a very generous amount. But God directing that so that people could, you know, very easily see and learn, wow, this is what it means to be like God. But I have more to give. Great. You, we, we, have a, we have an avenue for that, too. It's very easy to lose sight of what the money represents. You know, it's, it's a convenience, yes. But all of, all of the money that, especially that the church, our little church takes in, is really symbolic of all the hard work that the people of God have done you know, by which God rewarded uh, their labors, you know, providing that daily bread, the opportunities to work, the, the skills and the talents and the capabilities to carry out the, the, the duties and responsibilities of your job. You know, all of that is converted to money, but we should never lose sight of what that money represents. It's a lot of blood and sweat and tears. Uh, of, of, of the people of God. You know, and, and, and in that way, you know, that because it's easier, it's easy to visualize when that, that's what you actually see. You know, the, the, the labor of the people. You know, so in, in the priests, for example, that was easy to see. And you now the more of, wow, we really need to make sure we're, we're getting these guys what, what they're owed. But in being good stewards of, of, the, of the things that God has, has given to us, has entrusted to us, is these things of great value. Yeah. Not, not to lose sight of that. You know, same with the animals uh, and, 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 and the produce, too, of course. Um, you know, that these are, the animals are living creatures. You know, with precious lives. No, and th and that their care um, required a lot of a, a lot of labor, you know, of those of those shepherds and um, and 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 ranch owners. Uh, again, with the produce and the grains, those who planted, those who tilled, those who uh, weeded, those who reaped, those who uh, separated the, the the chaff from the grain. Uh, loaded in sacks, brought it to brought it to market, or bring it directly to the church. You know, there's there's a lot that that represents. All of this, all of this economics, the economics of the temple is really just all about the the cost that God Himself was uh, was generously bearing. In, in everything that he did to prepare his son to come into the world, then uh, uh, come into the world, and as we'll meditate, especially tomorrow, as he gives his life, you know, priceless, so that we could be redeemed and be the priceless children of God. That's how much God loves you. And, and taking this money because the temple... Uh, had been had been destroyed in the prior siege. Um, you know, there repairs need to be made, and again, um, that takes money because it's going to take materials, and it's also going to take the skill of of the builders. And those are mentioned later on in verse oh, 11 and twelve. You know, we've got carpenters. Builders, masons, stone cutters. Um, you know, so that now they have meaning and purpose to their labors, putting their talents and skills into service so that they can um, render work worthy of being permanently on display in the house of the Lord. You know, for as long as that building stands, it stands as a testimony to their 
their handiwork. And above all, to the handiwork of God who has made them and raised them to be those people of talent, just like he's done the same for you. And and does what he does with your talents and skills currently and, and who knows what you'll end up uh, doing in the future. But yeah, so that they're going to fix the temple. Um, now, even while they were, um, you know, took them, took them a while, you know, so that Joash calls Jehoiada the priest, at, this is verse 7, and says, um, hey, royal dude, what's, what's happening? Why isn't this fixed? Um, don't take any more money from the people. You know, get the work done. They've paid it. They've paid for it. Get that done. And and this has to do with with showing good faith effort on on the part of those who have been entrusted with the people's money. Hey, they they gave you money for these purposes. Show them that you're you are fulfilling those purposes before you ask for another cent from them you, again for those purposes yes there's still you know the payment for the sin offerings and and tithes and such but in in this regard it was like you need to you know lest they become complacent and and the next level you know greedy Saying, get get the job done. So again, there's a lot of wisdom, you know, packed into this little chapter. And the priest agreed. Yep, we're not going to receive any more money from the people, um, you know, for for the, for that purpose. And in verse nine and following, this this brilliant, um, a uh, stroke of genius. Uh, by by Jehoiada and and making here this this treasury box, you know, so that the offerings that go into it are are blind. In other words, you can't see what I put in. Uh, I can't see what you put in, you know, directly because we're just dropping it in a hole. And, it, and of course, it's also um, kept safe. You know, lead them not into temptation. You know, make make sure that this money is secure. But at the same time, it's giving the very clear depiction on what the people are doing together. Where all of a sudden it's like, that thing is full already. Now, it's not made of glass. They can't see that. But you can tell when you can't stuff any more, you know, $5 bills in it. Hey, it's it's up to the top here. We can't cram anymore in. And this brings us back to such other passages in the scriptures, like like uh, the book of the prophet Malachi, which is actually written much later. But where, where God uh, tells the people again, bring the tithes into my house and and test me in this. If I will not return to you, even more than what I have first given you. You know, I blessed you richly. Bring your tithe, and I'm going to give you so much that um, I'm going to open for you the windows of heaven and pour down such you such blessings that you're not going to have room to hold it all. And 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 that's what's being depicted here. They've created this treasure box, and and encouraged the people. To, to to give as God has first given you. Yeah, so, so it's not law preaching, it's gospel preaching. Look at what God has given. You know, like, start giving what God demands, doggone it. But, but, but even in those things that are required, like God is saying, uh, in, in through the prophet Malachi, bring the tithes. That's a requirement. But remember what it represents. The greater that I've given you, and I promise you, 
I'll give you even more. I'm not going to set you up for failure. I always set my people up for success. You know, and same here, this challenge, fill this thing up and you fill it to the full. And, and, and thereby see what they can do and accomplish together. You know, whereas, you know, for, uh, you know, widows might only be able to give a, a mite or two. But when they begin to pool their resources together, you know, all of those little mites become very mighty indeed. Yeah, you know, and, it's, and it's the same, it's the same, you know, things that we do, you know, in, in our own church, even though we, we do it a little differently. Um, but but the same the same principles apply, you know, and how we've been able to, you know, keep this going, um, you know, on, on a shoestring, you know, because uh, because the, the people of God respond and, and our needs are met, you know, and, and again, God showing, you know, what great things his people can do together. You know, any one of us, you know, it would be a, it, it could be a very real hardship, but doing it together, um, this, this is why God has brought, brought, brings his people together and why he has brought us particularly together. Again, going back to how God also accounts. It's about you that Jesus dies, not your money. You know, not not any of the treasures of that you might be accumulating in this in this life. It's about you as a person, as a soul. You know, you you are the true treasure for which he he endures all of this. And again, he directs us to see this in the same way. Yeah, so I so I I treasure the the relationships that that I've been blessed to 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 begin here with each and every one of you. But but I've been uh, just kind of emphasizing this theme because it it really is kind of a recurring thing. Because then when we get to masons and stone cutters and carpenters and such, that doesn't sound very temple-y. You know, when, when we, when you talk, if we, if, you know, we, we otherwise ask the question, you know, who, who works in a temple? You know, the, 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 the instant answer is, well, the priest. Well, that's true, but there's a lot more that actually work at a temple, not necessarily long term or daily, <laughs> but there were work, there were workers, you know, and that if they didn't do their job, there, there wouldn't be a temple. You know, so that those who are skilled with, with working wood and stone, um, those who are skilled at, at, at working the metal, you know, especially with uh, all of the, the, the church furnishings, you know, that the altar, you know, you know, is, is, is covered with, with, with metal, with bronze. You know, and, and, and things of that nature. So there's, there was a, a lot of, again, skilled labor that went into to that work. And now with the repairs. You know, so that, that to see that their work, you know, while it's on the one hand construction work, it, it's, it's also unlike any other construction work because of the building that they are uh, repairing and because of the purpose for which that building is is being repaired to make it worthy of the presence of God and his people. What makes it the temple is not just God. You know, God inhabits all things. What makes it the temple is that it's God meeting with his people. Just like church, while church is a building, you know, the building is there right now up in Tony, it's empty. And, and while God might be inhabiting there, and maybe a few angels, um, 
the the real the 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 real action of the church won't take place until tomorrow night when again god is there and and a bunch of angels and especially the the earthly angels of the people of god who come there to hear the gospel of good friday and all that god was willing to endure to to buy you back as his priceless treasure They, they use these uh, these articles of the temple for different purposes here um but but even there the the the, the indirect reference is that those those silversmiths and artisans that that are able to fashion those 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 metal bowls and basins and and trumpets you know articles of gold and silver and the like you know that that god had appointed to again, to, uh, to help illustrate by visual example um, that his people are worth more than that gold and silver that is that is found there on you know in the in the different kinds of articles um, again bowls basins and the like in the Lord's house. All of that is is cool all of that is sacred but there's nothing more cool and sacred than the people of god being there with god because church is church even without all these uh these fancy uh accompaniments because it's about god and his people that's the church and verse 15 Moreover, they did not require an account from the men uh, into whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to the uh, workmen, for they dealt faithfully. You know, that faithful stewards don't need to be asked to give an account because they're faithful, and their faithfulness will be evident in the result. Because the results will be above and beyond. You know, this this Christians aren't minimalists. We never ask, what's the bare minimum that I can do and 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 get away with? Uh, and in, in terms of what does God require of me? What's the bare minimum? You know, what what's the minimum thing that I need to do to get into heaven? True Christians don't approach that question that way because we're not minimalists. In, in, in the same way that God is not a minimalist saying, oh, I have to give you this. I'm going to give you this much and no more. And then you're going to have to you know, work out the rest of that. But rather, we are maximalists. In the sense of we return to the Lord in, in, uh, through service to our neighbors um, as much as we uh, possibly can. Yeah, so that it's, it's you know, while, while the Old Testament was 10%, that's the tithe. But that's the minimum. This is why the, the uh, opportunity to give more in the free will offerings was there. So that while they say, well, I've given of my tithe and I'm giving so much more. Because God has given me even more than this. God has so richly blessed me. And again, that's returned in, in many different ways both directly to the church, again, in, in offerings, but this doesn't limit the, the giving of the people of God that are being described here in this chapter because they're going out and, and returning of, of themselves in, in love to their neighbors. You know, they're going out and helping everybody they possibly can in any way they possibly can, and they also aren't giving an account because it's evident 
It's evident in the lives they live and the joy that they express in doing it. Because Christians do this and and the the uh, spiritual emotion of joy can't but escape from us. We can't help it. It's nothing that we have to even work at. It just happens. You know, it just happens. You know, which is why y'all are, are so happy all the time and joyful. Because it just happens for you. And this isn't anything that we have to work at. It comes naturally as a part of our Christian work. You know, it's 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 one of the fruits of it. Because this is one of the fruits that the Holy Spirit supplies in all of this. He gives us faithfulness, and we work this out faithfully, and there's still more that, that proceeds from that spirit, and it comes out in in in, in patience, in in long suffering, in, in joyfulness. In peacemaking, all of these, all of these great and groovy things, and in that last verse again, and these these sin offerings and the and the uh, uh, trespass offerings, sin offerings, these these are the the distinction here is be is like the distinction between what we call original sin or inherent sin. And, and actual sin, original sin, our, our fallen nature, what we inherited from our, our our first parents, Adam and Eve. You know, that that's ongoing sin, which always needs uh, re, uh, uh, re repentance, you know, contrition and sorrow, you know, to, to lament our fallen state. Trespass uh, is when we go above and beyond that. In other words, by nature, we are sinful and unclean. Trespass offerings are those actual things that we commit because of the fallen nature. That when I call, you know, Jared a poo, -poo head, you know, mean-spiritedly, you know, not just as a goofy Bible study example. You know, especially if I was spreading that, that hateful uh, gossip around the parish. Did you know Jared's poopoo head? Um, that would be an example of a trespass against Jared and against uh, against the, my congregation, uh, against humanity, against God. So those are the two different ones so that we again see that God covers both. So God covers both. You know, and the cost is the same. The life of his son. The innocent blood shed for the guilty. And that it's signified, especially in the Old Testament, by this, by this payment of this, of these sacrificial animals. And again, God using these things in many different ways, also using that as a means by which to feed his servants, his priests, because particular portions of some of those sacrifices were were apportioned to the priests. Hey, you get the front quarter of, of this particular animal. That's for the priests to eat. You know, the rest of it is is you know becomes a whole burnt offering or whatever the directive of God might be in that particular instance. But all of this to show the people of God the cost of sin, but even more, you know, that's, that's the law talking, but even more, the gospel proclamation is God saw you as worth the price. Because he, he, he sees you in your glorified state as as priceless you 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 have that worth and value before god because you will become his faithful children
And just just in quick passing, the death of Joash, not unlike our Lord Jesus. A conspiracy arises, and he's killed by his own servants. Even as our Lord Jesus is betrayed by one of his own disciples. You know, and, this is a, and in conspiracy with those priests that paid 30 pieces of silver to Judas so that he might betray his, his rabbi. And, and Judas did it for, 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 that, for that cost. And yet God turns that all into a, into a very mighty, glorious flood of his grace for us. Because he loves you, man. And I do too. <laughs>